welcome to episode 135 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. Could the Chinese delivery model work in Western countries? Juan Sotolongo, a senior partner at 722 Consulting, explains how e-commerce delivery works in China and the lessons that could apply for delivery in the West. Joining me on the line is Juan Sotolongo, Senior Partner at 722 Consulting. Juan, welcome. We're going to be talking about the Chinese delivery model versus the standard delivery model we have in the West. That's a very broad way of putting it. But well, why don't we kick this off by starting with what standard delivery expectations are in the West, or sort of how that's evolved, versus what's happening in China. Yeah, I've had the chance to work in China for the last few years, and obviously also in, in the U.S. and Europe. So I got a pretty good appreciation of the differences in the operating model. And typically, the U.S. slash Western Europe model involves kind of a hub and spoke system that you have a centralized hub that consolidates packages for other hubs. Then you get into the local hub that then distributes to typically in a major city one or two depots where the dispatch drivers in the morning who go out all day in big trucks and come back in the evening. Well, China is quite different. Uh, Typically, in a a city like Shenzhen, which is similar in size to London, there would be 60 to 80 service centers. The typical service center in China is about 2,000 square feet, and it could be a storefront, it could be a garage, and they dispatch somewhere around 20 to 30 courier drivers there on bikes. And they come back and forth to the service centers multiple times during the day. So when you start comparing then the, the, the time in transit, which is what I think is important here. In the West, the package picked up in the morning in Miami, for instance, going to Miami will get delivered tomorrow. A package picked up in Shenzhen in the morning in Shenzhen will get delivered in the afternoon in Shenzhen. And that's enabled by having metro hubs and multiple ways of picking some collections that go back and forth to the service centers that allow this to happen. And I think this is quite relevant as, as the push for faster deliveries and, and same-day deliveries becomes a reality of the, you know, the current customer demands of e-commerce, that that model, in my opinion, requires a bit of thinking and it work in the West. Well, you've just mentioned the, the waves of drivers going back and forth, but I, I feel like a key part of this is also the kind of vehicle that they're using because we're sending out, let's say, a van in the morning. Let's take Australia Post. I know I always go back to Australia Post. Let's take Australia Post. There's a van that goes out in the morning and does deliveries for several hours and then comes back in the afternoon to drop off undelivered parcels, let's say. Are you? Are we talking about vans here in the Chinese model or bikes or push bikes? What are we talking about? No, they're, no, they're motorbikes, electric bikes. They can typically take maybe 15 to 20 packages. They'll typically make four to six trips a day. So they're handling between 100 and 120 packages in, a, in, in, in an eight-hour shift. But it's, it's all around the congestion. The, the, the van that you're talking about in, in Sydney is going to get stuck in traffic, while the bike I'm talking about in Shenzhen will not get stuck in traffic. And it's not only China. Uh, I've been working most recently in Thailand, and Bangkok is a very congested city. And the only way to deliver in, Thai, in, in, in Bangkok is with motorbikes. You know, you, or you're going to be stuck in traffic all day long. So... The demand from the customer is not going to change because of traffic. It's that we're, you know, it's it's up to us to find solutions that deliver what the customer is looking for. Now, so, you've just mentioned though about um, something that might be dropped off for delivery in the morning gets delivered in the afternoon, and that would be considered a premium service in you know, North America, Australia, Western Europe. Is it a premium service in China and Southeast Asian markets? Not at all. As a matter of fact, JD.com, major e-commerce platform in China, is proud to say that they deliver same day 70% of their packages of no additional cost to the consumer. The Chinese service levels evolve quite different than the West. And essentially, they have a model, which I call as soon as possible. And they do endeavor to actually achieve this as as possible. So a package picked up in the morning we we'll get delivered in the afternoon in Shenzhen or Beijing or Shanghai, which means that there is a metro hub that runs many hub sorts. A typical hub sort in the West will run three or four hours. These hub sorts will run for 45 minutes to one hour. So all the service centers pick up packages for Shenzhen, 
they go to the hub, consolidate, back to the service centers. So package picked up at 11.30. We'll be back at the, relative, at, the, at the relevant service center for delivery at 3.30 in the afternoon. And they go deliver. While in the West, that's just not physically possible the way that the, the infrastructure is laid out. When we think about major delivery centres in the West, they're often located, say, near an airport or a rail terminal or near arterial roads, which typically means they're outside the city or on the edge of the city, compared to what you're just describing now, these service centres which are dotted around inside the metropolitan and residential areas, I imagine. So is there a cost aspect to this as well that drives it, that you're able to, that you won't just can't find a big area to set up a big warehouse in in central areas? Oh, for sure. That is that is one of the key components that, you know, the density of the, the urban cities in, in China, there is no space. Uh, in fact, the same thing in the U.S., quite frankly. Uh, in major, major cities, the reason they're in the outskirts is because you cannot find the 100,000 square feet facilities. So finding facilities that are 1,000 to 2,000, 3,000 square feet is much more realistic and then you get a distributed base of drivers throughout the city so that so the delivery time from the service center to the customer it's much shorter than anything else that you know the the traditional network operators can could experience so with with this hub and spoke model that we have in the west versus what you're describing i mean is there a bil- the ability to go to sort at the service center level to another service center to make it completely uh, you know instead of a hub and spoke make it more of a web uh, network or or does that just add an extra level of cost and complexity to the operations what you just said the latter it would add another layer of complexity that they really don't have the space if you think of a city that's got you know, let's say 60 service centers for every center, service center to make a 60 or 59 way split potentially, and that and, and just just the, the trunking network between them would just be chaotic. So 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 we're still looking at those those parts. We'll be going back to a major sorting center, but they'll be coming out as soon as possible rather than next day. Correct, and and, and so and at the same time, so it's not only the city same day delivery that's that's enhanced. It's also in the provinces in China. So if a package picked up in the provinces, let's say in, in the Guangzhou area, Guangzhou to Shenzhen, package picked up in the afternoon in Guangzhou will get delivered early in the morning the following day using, in this case, a hub, a provincial hub to a provincial hub network. While in the West, that package may be delivered in the afternoon uh, just based on the arrival times. So... It not only enhances the same day, it also increases the, the, the coverage of next day service in the provinces within, within China. Now, when we've spoken previously, we've talked a lot about delivery to parcel lockers. And I get the feeling that parcel lockers form a key part to the modern day e-commerce parcel delivery offering in China, and I imagine soon across the rest of Southeast Asia. Can you just tell us a little bit about what what are some of the key drivers for having a parcel locker in China? And well, let's start with that, and I'll have a follow up question. Yeah, I think we spoke last year, and I mentioned the uh, the huge number of lo- locations. So, a typical city, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Beijing, would have somewhere between eight to ten thousand for a city, by the way, uh, parcel locker locations, typically with a hundred doors each, with incredibly high utilization. The 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 network of parcel lockers is shared by all the carriers, both from a, a, an investment perspective and then the usage perspective. And what happened was, and the reason that China had to go that way was just a huge growth that we're experiencing in the last mile delivery, just encountering a one minute delay in trying to find the consignee was backing up the entire network to such a degree that they had to find a different solution. So now... Parcel lockers are in every apartment building, every office building, huge amount of convenience. And the courier driver, who's the ultimate person that has to make a decision how to deliver that package, they're the ones that make the payments. They make micropayments to use of the locker. Micropayments, two, and two, two to three American cents sort of a payment. The doors are turned several times in the, during the day. So two and three cents used several times during the day. Believe it or not, the economics are playing out. But, but fundamentally, it was to enable a much more efficient last-mile delivery than had previously been, been possible. 
Well, then the question we have to ask then is, would this model work in in the West, in Western Europe, North America, and other places like that? Would would this kind of looking at the server centers, the multiple sorts per day, and a, a delivery network that has a higher usage of parcel lockers, would that work in the West? I am very interested in finding the answer to that question. My inclination, the reason I started studying this, is just to answer that. And I think, I can't think of a reason why not. Let me just say it that way, okay? The, the drive for same-day delivery is just not going to increase. The premiums, the current companies offering same-day delivery are having to charge incredibly high rates because they're a point-to-point network. So a different solution, I think, would be welcome in the marketplace. So, yes, I think that fundamentally, I can't think of why not. So I'm going to be exploring that further, and we'll get back to you one of these days with a more relevant answer. But it sounds to me like it would require a sharing of parcel locker networks as a key part of it. Uh, this is something that we've seen dedicated networks set up in many countries, not carrier agnostic parcel networks, parcel locker networks. Is is that a key part of it? This sharing element of the parcel locker network, for sure. And and, and I've been I've been in discussions with major parcel locker operators in Europe, and we're discussing that. And we've had some pretty significant movements because until now, the parcel operators, the UPSs, FedEx, Royal Mail etc. They were pretty arrogant and saying, no, I'm not going to share my network because it gives my competitor the same advantage that I'm going to get. They're not beginning to realize that the shared investment, the shared usage makes a lot of sense. And they're becoming, they're coming around. So I, I, I really think that in the next five years, uh, we're going to see that development at scale. So a city like London would have 5,000 locker locations uh, would not shock me at all. So, yes. I'll be very interested to see if, if some of the Western cities are able to support um, the parcel locker networks uh, from a real estate perspective. Just can you, have, can you share a couple of comments there? You know, yeah, because you think real estate in China is cheap? <laughs> I, they face I wouldn't the same know. issues. <laughs> right. Well, but like, no, they, they face the same issues. So, but if you look about, you take a step back, look what Amazon has done in the U.S. Amazon is deploying their own network of parcel lockers at scale. And they did a deal with one of the, most, the major real estate firms in the U.S. that has 50,000 locations in the U.S. to deploy parcel lockers in the lobby of their apartment buildings. That's how you do it. Because it makes sense. These apartment buildings are being clobbered with packages coming in in the concierge or somebody in the mailroom having to deal with all this. This is an enhancement to, to the persons living there, and the real estate owners, the big property owners, realize it. That's how you do it. No, I agree with you. I think there's, there's room for huge growth when it comes to apartment locker, apartment building parcel locker installations, and we've, we've so seen it gradually starting in, in various countries, in Russia, in Spain, um, and, uh, and you've mentioned the Amazon the Hub solution. I think that Amazon might frighten a few people. What do you think? Do you think Amazon's move, and they're, they're very, um, no, at, at moving at scale in the US, like you've just described, do you think that will um, give an incentive to some of the major carriers to get out there and set their own networks up? Now you're getting into one of my kind of fundamental beliefs that, that – the major carriers in the U.S., both UPS and FedEx, as far as I'm concerned, in relation to, UP, to Amazon, are in denial. It's not only the parcel lockers that, that Amazon is deploying that they're, they're in denial, but they're in denial that Amazon is going to be a major competitor to them. And I've written about this before, and it's all interrelated. So I think that the reluctance to change of the incumbents in the U.S. is going to offer Amazon bigger and bigger spaces to get into, until it's going to be, it may be too late. It's going to cost them real money one of these days. When Amazon starts delivering packages, business-to-business -business packages for third parties, which is the, the, the core profitable packages for UPS and FedEx, watch out. And they're in denial to this day. Total denial. So little aside from what you're discussing, but I have pretty strong opinions about it. 
Well, it is an aside. Now, I've, I've, I've introduced a topic that I've tried to avoid in recent weeks. Not talking. I've tried to not talk about Amazon. Here we go. I've, I've opened up the uh, Pandora's box there. But you one, did. I, I opened it up. But if we can bring it back just briefly to our topic of conversation before we wrap up, if you're a parcel operator looking at you know, getting closer to the customer, to delivering faster, to setting up your network so that Amazon doesn't want to compete with you or whoever it might be, wants to partner with you instead, is there an opportunity to look at the Chinese delivery model and then maybe embrace elements of it to make your delivery offering a better one? I think there is. And the beauty of it is that you don't have to do it everywhere at the same time. You can start by city by city, almost neighborhood by neighborhood. And and where there's enough density, you deploy service centers and you start the process Parcel lockers, you start the process, and, and that attracts business to you, and hence, you'll start growing it gradually. You don't have to do you know, Germany all at once. You can do Frankfurt and start providing that sort of solution in a localized manner. So yes, I think that there's a lot of scope for discussing this further, and, and beyond discussing it, really thinking about ways to implementing it. So hopefully, we'll both see some development in that area in the future. I think it's a really interesting discussion to have, and I'll be interested to see what uh, the listeners think of this, if you've got any comments on it. Um, well, Juan, you're on LinkedIn, aren't you? Can people connect with you on LinkedIn to, if they want to uh, discuss this further with you? Of course, yes. They're welcome to, yeah. So I'll, I'll stick I a link. I would love to engage in discussions about this. I'll stick a link on thepostalhub.com to Juan's LinkedIn profile. So if you want to talk to Juan about this more, you just contact him there. I'll be interested to hear what more what uh, what you listeners think about the possibility of grafting the Chinese delivery model onto the current standard Western delivery model. Juan Sotolongo, Senior Partner at 722 Consulting. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, yeah. Take care. Talk to you soon. Some great guests on the podcast in the coming weeks, including Mark Fallon, President and CEO of the Berkshire Company, talking about the US Postal Service's informed delivery, Matthew Galt, CEO and founder of e-commerce fulfillment company Fulfilio, will join us, and many more great guests guests. Never miss an episode of the Postal Hub podcast. Sign up for the Postal Hub e-newsletter. It's a weekly email update with the latest podcast and other news. Go to thepostalhub.com and sign up there. And you can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and you can also subscribe in Spotify. So please, if you're listening on either of those platforms, subscribe, follow, make sure you get an episode of the podcast downloaded to your device every week. If you're on LinkedIn, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. But as I always say, when you send that invitation to connect, just mention that you're a Postal Hub listener and I'll say yes to your invitation to connect. And if you want to contact me about, well, anything at all, really, my email address is ian at thepostalhub.com. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in and I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast.